tired of the cat. All right, so let's look at the first page, one through six. Which of those problems would you like to see? Number two? Okay. Any others on that page? Um, number six. And number six? Okay, so let's go to the six. Factor completely. We have two RS plus three RST minus eight R minus twelve RT. So here we have four terms and they don't appear to be like terms but as we look across I do think that we can factor out the greatest common factor uh, what what looks like uh, a common factor to all four terms R right GCF is R so let's go ahead and factor out an R that leaves us with 2s plus 3st minus 8 minus 12t. And the four terms that are inside the parentheses, there's a method called factory by grouping that I think will work well here. So if we split this into two smaller groups and now consider what the greatest common factor of these two terms is, what would you say that GCF is? S, right? Looks like we can factor out an S. So let's factor out an S, and that leaves us with 2 plus a 3T. Yes. And the greatest common factor for this second group? A 4. How about a negative 4? Okay, so that we can take care of that negative sign. So if we factor out a negative 4, that leaves us with a 2. And that leaves us with a positive 3t. And now we have two terms, and the greatest common factor is that 2 plus 3t. And I haven't forgot about the r. I'm going to carry that down in just a minute. That 2 plus 3t is a common factor, which leaves us with s minus 4. Now let's keep bringing that r down. So this becomes our final factorization. And do we have a choice that looks like that? Yes. Looks like letter E. Letter E. So don't forget about looking across all the terms first to see if you can find a greatest common factor and then follow whatever factoring technique seems appropriate. In this case, since we have four terms, that's the clue that led me to believe I should try to break that up into two smaller groups and use factoring by grouping. Any other comments on number two? We're good to go. That's good. Okay. Let's look at number six. Add and then simplify. So we have two over x squared minus nine plus five over x squared minus x. So what needs to be true when we add two fractions? Common denominator, right? Right now we have different denominators. Somehow we have to change these so that they become the same denominator, right? So we're going to start by factoring the two denominators. Here we have a difference of squares. So that factors how? Okay. 
to say x plus 3 and x minus 3. Good. x plus 3 and x minus 3. In either order. Okay. And for the second denominator, we need to look for two numbers that multiply to give us negative 12, but they add up to give us negative 1. Think of those two numbers. One has to be positive and one has to be negative, right? Negative 4 and positive 3 will work, right? Okay. So now we have to think about what does our new denominator have to be? Our least common denominator has to include every factor that you see at least once, and we have to include it to the highest power that we see it raised to. So we see an x plus 3 factor, and the highest power that it's raised to is to the first power. We see an x minus 3 factor, the highest power it's raised to is to the first power. And we also see an x minus 4 factor. So this is our least common denominator. So that's what we want both denominators to become x plus 3, x minus 3, and x minus 4. Now, let's think about what factor is missing from each one of those original denominators. Look at the first fraction. What, what factor is missing from that first denominator? x plus 3 is covered, x minus 3 is covered, but we're missing... We're missing that x minus 4, right? So that means that we're going to need to multiply, excuse me, that's a minus. We need to multiply by that missing x minus 4 factor, and whatever we do to the numerator, we have to make sure we also do to the denominator, right? Both places. In the second fraction, which factor was missing from the denominator to get to what we want it to be? The x minus 3 factor is missing, right? So that's what we have to multiply by, numerator and denominator. Because in essence, what we're doing is we're multiplying these fractions by 1 in a creative way. Right? We're not changing the value of the fraction, we're multiplying by 1. So now the two denominators match, which means that we can combine the two fractions, right? So we have a 2 times an x minus 4. And we have a plus 5 times x minus 3. And if we go ahead and distribute, we have 2x minus 8 plus 5x minus 15. And all of that is over our common denominator. Now we can clean up that numerator a little bit by combining like terms. 2x plus 5x is 7x. Negative 8 minus 15 is negative 23. And I don't think we can simplify any further. I think this will have to be our final answer. Do we have a choice that looks like that? Mm -hmm. e. Looks like letter E again, right? Uh, yeah. Anything else on that first page? I can number three, I don't understand how to get the minus three X on the answer. Okay, so sure. Let's take a this only has two terms so we have to hope that this has some sort of special factoring pattern clearly not differences squares 
but is it a sum or difference of cubes? That looks hopeful, right? As it stands, these are not cubes, though. But there is a common factor. What can we factor out for both terms? A 2, right? So if we factor out a 2, we're left with x cubed plus 27. And now we have a sum of cubes. This is clearly a perfect cube, and 27 is a cube. Okay, let me get just some cubes. Some so let's review quickly how to factor a sum of cubes. This is number 3. Okay. You want to bring it? Let's off to the side remind ourselves how this will factor. This will factor as a plus b times a squared minus a b plus b squared. So clearly x is what's being cubed here. So this x is acting like the a. That's the quantity being cubed. And here, the quantity that's cubed is 3. So 3 is acting like our mean. And now we just have to come up here and substitute x for a and substitute 3 for b. Okay. So this is going to factor as a plus b is now x plus 3. A squared, that's x squared, right? Minus a times b, 3 times x, or x times 3, plus b squared, if b is 3, 3 squared would give us 9. And again, we have that 2 that should be carried over to the front. And so this becomes our factored form. Do we have a choice that looks like that one? D? Okay. So you asked for what, where something came from. The minus jx. I, I just forgot the formula. I forgot the formula. So this is a formula that you need to commit to memory. And your instructor may or may not have um, shared with you an acronym, SOAP, S-O-A-P. It tells you how to put the signs in. The first sign is always the same as the original sign. The next sign is opposite of the original sign. And the third sign is always positive. And the reason that's helpful is, while it doesn't apply to this problem, if you're factoring a difference of cubes, the same pattern holds. You still have the same five quantities. You still have an A, and a B, and an A squared, and an AB, and a B squared, just like you had up here. But now the signs are going to follow SOAP. The same sign is now subtraction here. Opposite sign would now be addition. And the third one's always positive. That's the two. Okay. So that SOAP acronym will actually help you remember two ways to factor sum of cubes and the difference of cubes. All right. Anything else on that first page before we move on to page two? We already saw problems two and six. All right, let's go to that second page and let's find the, the good problem from that second page. So we're looking at seven through 13. And all of this is being video recorded, so we post it so that you can watch it later. Mm -hmm. oh. 7 through 13. Where are my winning problems? So, 7? Yeah. Any nominations for what's after 7? 11. 11?
complex fraction. A complex fraction is a fraction that contains fractions within, its, within itself. So we have uh, 3 plus the quantity 7 over x in the numerator, and 1 over xy plus 2 over y in the denominator. There are two different ways that we could attack this problem. One way, which is the way I want to do this, is to first identify the least common denominator of all the individual fractions. So looking at the three denominators that we have here, what would you say is the LCD, the least common denominator? XY. XY, I agree. So what we're going to do with that least common denominator is we're going to multiply the numerator and the denominator of the complex fraction by the LCD. So if I multiply everything by XY, 3 gets multiplied by XY, 7 over X get multiplied by XY. I don't know where that 3 came from. Muscle memory, okay. And this will be multiplied by XY, and this will be multiplied by XY. The reason that is helpful is that now those individual fractions are going to disappear. You see that X in the denominator here? It's going to divide out with the X in the numerator. The X and the Y here will divide out. And the Y here will divide out with that Y. So what we're left with is 3XY. Then we have a 7Y. In the denominator, we have 1 plus 2 times X. I don't think this is going to find any further. I don't see a way that we can factor or divide out common factors. So hopefully one of the answer choices looks like this. Looks like letter B. Agree? Oh, no, sorry. B? B. So don't get intimidated by those complex fractions. They're actually pretty simple to simplify as long as you take the time to identify the correct least common denominator. All right, let's look at 11. have to find what 64 over 27 raised the negative two-thirds power. Well, there's two different things happening with the exponent here. First of all, it's a fraction, and second of all, it's negative. So we're going to have to attack those two things separately. First, I'm going to address the negative part of the exponent. Whenever you have a negative exponent, that means that you have to look at the reciprocal of that base. So I'm going to go ahead and flip that base, make it 27 over 64. And by finding the reciprocal of the base, I'm taking care of that negative part. So now this becomes a positive 2 thirds exponent. Now let's look at what it means to be raised to the 2 thirds power. The denominator of the exponent tells us the index that needs to be placed on the radical. So this is actually a cubic root of 27 over 64. The numerator of the exponent tells us what that result has to be raised to. Luckily, 27 is a perfect cube, and so is 64. So the cubic root of 27 over 64, very nicely, comes out to be 3 fourths. That result now has to be squared. 3 squared is 9, 4 squared is 16, and we're done. So that is... Letter B again. Okay, what else?
thoughts from page two? You all ask at the same time. I can't think out what you're saying, so be courteous with each other. Well, let's say eight. Let's do eight. <laughs> that contains rational expressions. So this is what we call a rational equation. Anytime we see fractions, our first instinct should be to clear them, right? to get rid of them. We can do that by multiplying both sides of the equation by the least common denominator. And what would that be in this case? No. 12. 12, I agree. I think if we multiply both sides of the equation by 12, we'll be able to clear fractions. So everything is going to get multiplied by 12. So you see that 4 goes into 12 three times. 3 goes into 12 four times. And 12 goes into 12 one time. So what we're left with is 3 multiplied by 4x plus 1 minus 4 multiplied by 2x plus 3, and that's equal to 7. Denominators are gone. We're feeling a little bit less anxious, right? Okay. So now it's a matter of distributing, collecting like terms, and then isolating our variable, right? So 3 times 4x is 12x, 3 times 1 is 3, here we get a negative 8x, negative 12 equals 7. Let's combine like terms, 12x minus 8x, that's 4x, 3 minus 12, that's negative 9. Isolate x, let's add 9 to both sides. And finally divide both sides by 4. And we get x equals 4. And we check back to make sure that that doesn't cause any problems in the original rational equation, but we're good to go, right? 4 is not one of the restricted values. We want to make sure that none of the original denominators ever become 0 because division by zero is undefined, but in this case, those denominators were constants, so we're good. So, for number eight, that is letter A. All right, what's next on page two? 13. 13? Sure. together, but they're special. They're conjugates. They have the same real part and the same imaginary parts, but with opposite signs. These are what we call conjugates. It should remind you of what happens when you multiply conjugates into real numbers. What happens when you multiply a plus b times a minus b? Anybody remember? Do you end up with three terms or just two? Almost. Almost. That happens when you're squaring binomial. But when you're multiplying conjugates, those middle terms add up to zero. Right? They add up to zero. So we actually just end up with a squared minus b squared. We get a difference of squares. 
y, a times a gives you a squared. a times negative b gives you a negative a. b times a gives you a positive a b. And then b times b gets you a negative b squared. These add up to zero. Right. Same thing's going to happen when we're dealing with conjugates in the complex numbers. Okay? Now, you can either remember the pattern or you can just foil it out, distribute as usual, and then you'll see that those middle terms are going to add up to zero. It doesn't matter. Uh, but we do get 6 squared minus 2i quantity squared. If you trust me that those middle products are going to add up to zero, we end up here. So 6 squared, of course, is 36. 2i quantity squared, we have to square the 2 and we have to square the i. 2 squared is 4, and then i squared is going to be replaced by the what number? i squared? Mm -hmm. Negative 1? Negative 1. Negative one. Correct. So, this actually becomes 36 plus 4, this becomes 40. Off to the side here, remember, i squared is negative 1. Right. Anything else on page 2 before we move on? Starting with number 14 up through number that contains a radical in the denominator, this is not in simplified form. One of the criteria for being completely simplified is that you can't have a radical in a denominator. So we have to do what's called rationalizing the denominator. What we're going to do is we're going to multiply this fraction by 1, but in a creative way. We're going to choose to multiply by 1 in such a way that we no longer have a radical in the denominator. So we're going to make some room here. Think about what is appropriate to multiply by. But let's talk about our goal. Our goal in that denominator is to have a cubic root of factors that are raised to the third power. Okay? So we want those exponents under the radical to match the index. So ideally, we would want that 2 to be raised to the third power. And ideally, we would want the x also raised to the third power. So this is our goal. Why do we want that? Because when the index and the exponent under the radical match, those two operations are inverse operations and they undo each other. And so this denominator will simplify to just 2x, which is great because the radical would be gone. Okay. So, if this is our goal and this is our starting point, that should help us find out what would be appropriate to multiply by. It looks like we're missing two of the factors of two, right? So we're going to multiply by two squared in the right hand here. And it also looks like we're missing two of the factors for x. And again, we're multiplying by one, so we have to make sure we do the same thing to the numerator. So, here we get 2 times the cubic root 
let's just rewrite this as 4x squared. So in the numerator, we have 2 times the cubic root of 4x squared. In the denominator, we have 2x. I can divide out those 2s, right? 2 divided by 2 is just 1. So our final answer becomes the cubic root of 4x squared all over x. And we cannot simplify any further Notice that those x factors are trapped under the radical. They're not eligible to be divided out with the x and the denominator. And hopefully one of the choices looks just like that, right? Yes. Is it 16? Yeah, looks like no. Let it be. viewing public, I'm going to have to try to draw this graph as best as I can. So let's look for some key points to help guide our graph. It looks like one of the boundary lines has a positive slope and has a y-intercept at negative 1 and an x-intercept at positive 1. So it's going to pass through these two. dash line. So right here, I can use this graph of this boundary to think about the equation of that boundary line. I already know the y-intercept is negative 1. So for this line, I know the y-intercept is negative 1. I have to find out what the slope is. Well, think about the navigation from this point to that point. I have to go up 1 and to the right 1. It looks like the slope is positive 1. Positive one. Right. So y is equal to just x minus 1. Let me write this a little bit better. y is equal to x minus 1. Now that's the equation of the boundary line, not of the inequality. So now if you look at your graph, you see that the shading is below this line. You see how the shading is below? That tells you that the inequality symbol here is going to have to be the less than symbol. When you're shading below a boundary, it's less than. When you're shading above a boundary, it's greater than. You also have to look at whether the boundary line is dashed or solid. In this case, because it's solid, this is going to be a strict inequality. Not solid, dashed, right? It's dashed. It's dashed. That's what I meant, it's dashed. If it had been solid, we would have had a weak inequality. But in this case, we do not. Okay? So that's one of the two inequalities in the system. Look how easy that was, right? Now we just have to look at the other boundary line. And it looks like it has a y-intercept at positive 1. And another key point. We don't have another key point. But it looks like maybe the x-intercept is at a half, right, around here. So maybe another key point would be over here. If it passes through a half, we expect that to happen, right? So that's a solid boundary. That's a solid boundary. And we know the equation 
is going to have a positive one for the y-intercept. We have to think about the slope. Looks like to move from one point to the other, we have to go down two units and to the right one unit. So the slope would be what? Down two, right one? Negative two, one. Negative two over one, right? Or just negative two. Now, this is the area that was shaded in the graph. For this boundary line, did we have to shade below or above? We had to shade above, right? And so the inequality symbol here is going to point to the right. And because it's a solid boundary, this is going to be a weak inequality. So our system has these two inequalities. Y is less than x minus 1, and y is greater than or equal to negative 2x plus 1. Let's see if we can find something that looks like that. Uh, looks like letter A, letter A right? So this is that the type of problem where there isn't a lot of mechanical work. It's more interpreting, right? Have to work backwards from the graph to identify what the equation of the line is. And then think about which direction we did the shading. Right? Where is your solution set, above or below that boundary? And then do that again for the separate um, boundary line. Okay. Anything else on page three? We have a radical in the denominator, but it's not in its own, you know, it's not a, uh, a single term. It's stuck inside a binomial, right? We've got some subtraction going on here. So it wouldn't be helpful to just multiply by the square root of 3 over the square root of 3. That would still leave a radical in the denominator. We have to be a little bit more creative here. What we have to multiply by, actually it's still up there on the right, about a conjugate. Okay, think about a conjugate. Conjugates have exactly the same two terms but with opposite operations, right? So the way that we're going to rationalize is we're going to multiply by 8 plus the square root of 3. Okay, and we're going to do that in both the numerator and in the denominator. We want to make sure we don't change the value of the fraction. Just like what happened over there when we were working with the complex numbers and when we were working with the real numbers, what's going to happen here is that we end up with 8 squared minus square root of 3 squared. Those two middle products, when we FOIL, when we distribute, they're going to be opposites and they're going to add up to 0. Okay. So that's going to be our new denominator. And so 8 squared is 64. What's the square root of 3 quantity squared? These are inverse operations, right? They undo each other. So it's just 3. So that whole denominator just becomes 61. Okay? That whole denominator just becomes 61. In the numerator, we can leave this in factor form. We do not have to distribute. I think the answer choices have it in factor form, right? So let's see if we've got a winner. It looks like letter C.
So the key to rationalizing a denominator when the radical is contained as one of multiple terms is to multiply, uh, in this case, by the conjugate. Okay? And that will get rid of that radical in the denominator. Quadratic. It's a quadratic equation. It's already in standard form. One of the first things we should try is to factor, if possible. In this case, we would have to look for two numbers that multiply to 4 and add up to negative 2. The problem is I can't think of those numbers. I don't think those numbers exist. So factoring is not going to work. I could complete the square, but that's a very lengthy process. I think I'm just going to jump right to the quadratic formula, which will complete the square for me. Okay. So let's go ahead and use the quadratic formula. Opposite of b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c all over 2 times a. We need to know that one. We need to know that one. That's the quadratic formula. Now, what are a, b, and c referring to? They're referring to those coefficients, right? So here a is 1. B is negative 2, and C is positive 4. Now, you plug those three numbers into the formula and simplify. Okay. So we get X is equal to the opposite of B plus or minus the square root of B quantity squared minus 4 times a times c all over 2 times a. So in that step, all I did was substitute the values for a, b, and c into the quadratic formula. Now we need to clean this up a bit. So, Opposite of negative 2 is positive 2. And we have plus or minus square root of negative 2 quantity squared is 4, right? We have 4 times 1 times 4, that's 16. So we have negative 16. And all of that is over 2. In that radicand, we're going to end up with a negative number. 4 minus 16 is a negative 12. Now, I need to simplify this. Because we're taking a square root of a negative number, that's going to produce the imaginary number i. And I also have to think about how to factor 12. I'm going to factor 12 as 4 times 3. 4 being a perfect square, that's going to come out as a 2. So we have 2 plus or minus 2 times i times the square root of 3 all over 2. And we're really close to being finished, but we, need, we can simplify this further. We have two terms in the numerator, and they both contain a factor of 2. So let's go ahead and factor out that greatest common factor. We have 2 times 1 plus or minus i times the square root of 3, and all of that is over 2. And 
Now the twos are eligible to be divided out, right? Two goes into two one time. So the final answer will be one plus or minus i times the square root of three. These are two solutions. We just write them together in a condensed form. One of the solutions is one plus i times the square root of three. And the other solution is one minus i times the square root of three. So these are two separate solutions, but we can write them in this condensed form. And is there an answer choice that looks like this one? A. Yeah, it looks like letter A. Okay, we're making great progress. Let's turn over to page four. Let's find the most interesting problems there. And just to let you know, we are here until a little bit before 2 o'clock. At 2 o'clock, we have another group of students coming in for a statistics review. Okay, just so you can budget your time on the rest of the problems. I'll go 21. 21? because we see that x raised to the fourth power and we say we didn't do anything like this in our class. But look across the trinomial there on the left hand side of the equation. What's the greatest common factor? What can we factor out from all three of those terms? x squared. And x squared, right? So let's do that. Let's factor out an x squared and see what happens. a little better. In the parentheses we have a quadratic, right? That trinomial hopefully can be factored. I think it can be. There's a couple of ways we can try to factor it, either by trial and error, just try different binomials that we think might work and find the one that works, or you can use the AC method, okay? Different classes may have taught you different ways. But if you use the AC method, you multiply the value of a times the value of c. In this case, we have a times negative 5. That's going to give us a negative 40. And we have to look for two numbers that multiply to negative 40 that add up to negative 18. So can we think of two numbers that multiply to give us negative 40, but they add up to give us negative 18? Negative 20 and positive 2. That's exactly right. Negative 20 and positive 2. So what do we do with these two numbers? Yeah, we're going to use those to split that middle term into two separate terms. Right? So I'm going to write this as 8x squared and uh, let's do minus 20x plus 2x minus 5. Okay. And I'm not going to forget about the x squared. I'm going to keep bringing that down. But now I have these four terms. I'm going to do factoring by grouping. Okay. Factoring by grouping. So for the first group, the greatest common factor is? 4 and x, I agree. That leaves us with a 2x and then a minus 5. For the second group, the greatest common factor is just 1. And that leaves us with a negative 2x minus 5. So now we have two terms. The greatest common factor is that 2x minus 5. We're left with a 4x plus 1. 
Now, let's remember and keep bringing down this x squared, right? And so we have this equation where this product results in zero. The zero product rule says one of those original factors must equal zero itself. Because the only way to get zero when you multiply is if you're multiplying by zero somewhere along the way. So we're going to get three mini equations here. Either x squared is equal to zero, or 2x minus 5 is equal to zero, or 4x plus 1 is equal to zero. one solution, x equals zero. This gives us one solution, x equals five halves. And this gives us a third solution, x is equal to negative one fourth. So our three solutions are zero, five halves, and negative one fourth. And let's see what answer choice goes with that one. carefully. I think it's letter D. Sometimes it's easier to work backwards from the answer choices by just substituting them in and see which ones work. But in cases where you have these fractions and negative fractions, it gets a little What else on this uh, page? As the hypotenuse of a right triangle is eight inches shorter than the shorter leg. I'm going to say that this is my shorter leg. I don't know how long it is. I'm just going to say it's x units long. I know the hypotenuse is eight units longer. The longer leg is four inches longer than the shorter leg. So this side I'm going to label as x plus 4. Hopefully you agree with the diagram. Because that's going to drive the equation. Pythagorean theorem says if you square the length of the two bases and then add up those squares, you get the square of the hypotenuse. that a squared plus b squared equals c squared, right? So now we need to carefully square. It's very common to forget about these middle terms. Here we have x squared. This gives us x squared plus 8x plus 16. If you're confused as to where the 8x comes from, Write this as x plus 4 times x plus 4 side by side. And when you FOIL, when you distribute, you'll see that you get two middle terms that are each 4x. 4x plus 4x gives you the 8x squared. On the right, again, we end up with three terms. Don't forget that middle term. We get x squared plus 16x plus 64. In fact, let's do a little bubble here. That's what we used here. And now I think it's a matter of combining like terms, and getting everything on one side of the equation, leaving the other side empty. 
So here we have a 2x squared, right? If we subtract x squared from both sides, we're left with 1x squared. If we subtract 16x from both sides, we end up with negative 8x. And if we subtract 64 from both sides, 16 minus 64 gives us a negative 48. And all of that is going to be equal to 0. So we've subtracted all three of those terms on the right. Okay. And we're left with this quadratic. Hopefully this is factorable. If not, we always have the quadratic formula to turn to. But can we think of two numbers that multiply to give us negative 48 and add up to give us negative 8? Think about one of them being positive and one of them being negative. Minus 12 Yeah, that works, right? Thank goodness. Negative 12 and positive 4 work. So that's going to give us two smaller equations to solve using the zero product rule. Either x minus 12 has to be zero or x plus 4 has to be zero. So that gives us two solutions, either x is 12 or x is negative 4. However, we have to remind ourselves we're working with a triangle. Right? It doesn't make sense to have negative length when you're talking about the sides of a triangle, right? So even though this is a solution to the equation we came up with, it doesn't make sense in the context of the problem. So we really only have one solution. And it's 12. And so that is letter B, because it's none of the none of the choices that were given. So there's one problem where working backwards um, may have taken you a long time and then you find out none of the answers work. That's great. That's great. All right, let's go to the next page, page five. So we're looking at problems 25 to 28. Anything there that looks interesting to you? actually not too bad because what we're dividing by is a single term. It's a monomial. It's more complicated if we have multiple terms in the denominator. Really, what we're going to do is what we would do if we were working with, with simpler fractions. You just write each term in the numerator over that denominator. And then we're going to simplify these separately. Now let's see what can be simplified. In the first fraction, 5 divided by 5 is 1, and m squared goes into m cubed m times. In the second fraction, 9 and 5 don't have any common factors, but these m squares will divide out to 1. And in the third fraction, 5 goes into 10 two times. And we have one factor of m in the numerator, two factors of m in the denominator. So when we divide, we're going to end up with, a, with an m factor in the denominator. So it looks really messy, but look at how simple this is going to turn out. In the first fraction, we're only left with an m. 
In the second fraction, we're left with that negative 9 fifths. And in the third fraction, we have a 2 in the numerator and an m in the denominator. Let's see if anything looks like this. Uh, a looks tempting, but that's not it. B looks C. tempting, but that's not it. Is C looks tempting, it's, it's not, not C. <laughs> it's D. Uh, it looks like D. All right. So it'd be an awful shame to pick the wrong answer choice after doing all the correct work. So make sure you look at all the answer choices carefully. Not bad, right? That one wasn't too bad. Yes. Okay, what else on this page? Because we don't have that much more to go. 26. following is the graph of 3x plus 4y equals 12. This is an equation for a line that is written in standard form. I think it's easiest if we find the x and the y intercepts and then compare those to the graphs that we're given. So first, I'm going to set y equal to 0 and solve for x. So if I set y equal to 0, I have 3x plus 4 times 0 equals 12. Well, that's just 0, isn't it? So that gives us 3x is equal to 12, or x is equal to 4. So when y is 0, x must be 4. That's my x-intercept. That's where the graph must cross over the x-axis. And now if I set x equal to 0, I'm going to be able to find the y-intercept. I'm going to set x equal to 0 in the original equation. I get 3 times 0 plus 4 times y equals 12. That's just 0. So I get 4 times y equals 12, or y equals 3. So when x is 0, y must be 3. That's my y-intercept. So as you look at the choices, which graph goes through these two points. Looks like letter A to B. Okay. The y-intercept is at 0, 4, and the x-intercept is at 0, 3? Yes. Letter A. number swapped. B has, oh wait a minute, you are right. I swap the numbers, you're right. I, if you were in my class, you would get two bonus points. <laughs> because I don't know what you, were about, you did at the beginning, but you did something really nice. Oh, you helped me with something. And then you found the right answer to this. Yes. Uh -huh. See, and there's, there's a perfect example of you did all the right work. It's all beautifully on your paper, and you go for the wrong answer choice. I mean, careless. Don't do that. Don't do that. All right. Anything else on this page before we go to the next one? We've got about maybe 10 minutes. Are you here for intermediate or statistics? Stats. Stats. Here. I'm just waiting, chilling. Okay. Last page. 
29 through 35. What strikes your fancy there? Monogram 29. 29, okay. asking us which is the graph of this equation? Well, it's a very simple looking equation. What type of line is this going to be? A vertical. A vertical line, right? And it's going to be three units to the left of the origin. So, one, two, three. Oh, that was pretty simple. That was pretty <laughs> simple. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. If you like those. Sorry. I just figured I'd choose the wrong one. Oh. That should make us feel good. Wow, there's problems that make you up really fast. <laughs> hey, Shelby. Hello. Um, there's some good ones on this page. I'm going to wait for you to tell me. Uh, 31. 31, okay. Yeah, that's one of the good ones. Shelby, we'll start at about two. This is uh, still the intermediate outcome. Okay. Simplify. Well, here we have three powers of y, and we're going to use both the product rule and the quotient rule. I'm going to write them off to the side just so we can refer to them. The product rule says. If we multiply two powers that have the same, excuse me, that have the same base, multiply two powers that have the same base, we can write this as a single power where we add the exponents. And the quotient rule says if we're dividing two powers that have the same base, I can write this as a single power where we subtract the exponents. So I'm going to have to use both of these rules because we have a product and a quotient. All three of those powers have the same base, and that's really important. So this is going to become y to the one-third plus 3 over 6 minus, what's the exponent here? One. It's an invisible one. We need to find a common denominator. This looks like it's 6, right? So I'm going to write this as 2 over 6 plus 3 over 6 minus 6 over 6. 2 plus 3 is 5. 5 minus 6 is negative 1. So we get y to the negative 1 over 6. There's a couple ways second. that we can simplify this, but... Could you go back for the second stage, where you have 2 over 6? One third. Mm -hmm. We want it to have a denominator of 6, so we have to multiply by 2. We have to multiply by oh, 2 okay. over 2. Okay. And with the 1, we will multiply one by, by 6 one. over 6. Okay. Okay. If we look down at our answers, none of them look anything like this, right? So the correct answer is actually letter E, none of these. None of these. Your confidence going up as you go through this? Some of it is getting less fuzzy, hopefully. Hopefully the test is like that. You just have to prepare for it and you go in and kill it. Come in feeling prepared? You're going to deliver. All right, what else on this page? There 
there are several methods for solving a system of equations. We can use the addition or the elimination method. We can use substitution or we can use graphing. I think elimination works well here. Okay. I think that if we just subtract the bottom equation from the first one, it will eliminate the y variable. Okay. So to subtract the second equation, I just need to go in and change these signs, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to make that positive, I'm going to make that negative, and I'm going to make that negative. So all I did was I multiplied the second equation by negative 1. And now I'm going to add like terms. x plus 2x is 3x, y minus y is 0, and negative 5 plus negative 1 is negative 6. Divide both sides by 3, and I get x is equal to negative 2. Now I can go back into either of the original equations and substitute this value for x to find out what the corresponding y value needs to be. I'm going to go ahead and use this first one. I have negative 2 plus y is equal to negative 5. Add 2 to both sides. What's negative 5 plus 2? Negative three. negative 3. So negative 2 for x, negative 3 for y. That's our solution set. And they don't want the solution set, they just want y. So b, y is equal to negative 3. All right, let's go to 32. We may have time to do one more after 32. Let's see. Our best bet is to use a square root property. As opposed to expanding out that binomial that's being squared and doing anything fancy, let's take advantage of the fact that we have a perfect square. Now, the square root property says the following. It says, if x squared is equal to k, then x must be equal to plus or minus square root of k. And that's what we're going to use here. Instead of just x squared, we have x plus 5 that's being squared, but we can still use this property. So we're going to say x plus 5 is equal to plus or minus square root of 3. Do the parallel to this property? Now we isolate x by subtracting 5 on both sides. So we get x is equal to negative 5 plus or minus square root of 3. So we have two solutions, negative 5 plus the square root of 3 and negative 5 minus the square root of 3. That's letter D.